from Daily Trust News Center. This is the News Hour. On News Hour tonight, National Broadcasting Commission imposes 5 million naira fine on Trust TV for broad broadcasting documentary on banditry. Nigerian Air Force launches Operation Show No Mercy against terrorists. PDP Board of Trustees meeting holds in Abuja silent on crisis rocking the party. And on the foreign scene, Iran nuclear talks to restart in Vienna with EU mediation. Hello and welcome to Trust News Hour. I am Ainde Shuaga. The National Broadcasting Commission, NBC, has imposed a fine of 5 million naira on Trust Television Network, Trust TV, over the documentary, or the broadcast of a documentary titled Nigeria's Banditry, the Inside Story, which was aired by the station on the 5th of March, 2022. The NBC, in a letter to Trust TV dated August 3, 2022, and signed by its Director General, Balarabe Shehu Ilela, said the fine was imposed on Trust TV because its broadcast of the said documentary contravened sections of the National Broadcasting Code. A statement by Trust TV's management says, while it is currently studying the Commission's action and weighing our options, it wishes to state unequivocally that as a television station, it believes it acted in the public interest by shedding light on the thorny issue of banditry and how it is affecting millions of citizens in the country. The documentary, according to the statement, traces the root of the communal tensions and systemic inadequacies which led to the armed conflict that is setting the stage for another grand humanitarian crisis in Nigeria. It maintained that the documentary presents insights into the intersection of injustice, ethnicity and bad governance as drivers of the conflict while aggregating voices of experts and key actors towards finding solutions, including those of the Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, Senator Saidu Mohammed Dansadao, who hails from one of the worst hate communities in Zamfara State. Similar fines were also imposed on pay TV platforms, multi-choice, Star Times, and TSTV, for broadcasting a documentary by BBC Africa I titled Bandits Warlords of Zafara. In the meantime, the International Press Center on Wednesday expressed disappointment with the National Broadcasting Commission over the five million era fine slammed on Trust Television Network after a documentary on the state of insecurity in the country titled Nigeria's Banditry, the Inside Story. The IPC, in a statement by its press freedom officer, Melody Lawal, on Wednesday, described the imposition as an arbitrary fine. She reminded the federal government, the Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, and the NBC that the banditry ravaging Nigeria and putting the lives and property of the citizens in jeopardy was not a creation of the media. Information Minister Lai Mohammed had last Thursday threatened sanction against Trust Television for its documentary that highlighted plight of victims of banditry in northern Nigeria. In its reaction to the threat to sanction Trust Television and others, International Press Center Lagos expressed worry over the development, saying government should not dictate how the media should present its report to the public. IPC Executive Director Lanre Arogundade in a statement said, while spate of insecurity affects everyone, credible information is key to get to the root cause of the situation. Similarly, the Socioeconomic Rights and Accountability Project, SERAP, in a letter signed by its Deputy Director Kolawole Oluwadari, 
said the media has a duty to impart information and ideas on issues of public importance, noting that carrying out threat of sanction would lessen flow of diverse viewpoints and information to the public. A Kaduna-based Islamic scholar, Sheikh Ahmad Gumi, also condemned threat to sanction media for coverage of prolonged bandits attacks across the country. The Federal Executive Council has approved a contract to buy 60 utility vehicles with gadgets and associated accessories for security agencies working in the Federal Capital Territory, FCT, Abuja. Minister of the FCT told newsmen at State House Abuja that the vehicles and equipment were valued at over 2.6 billion naira. Also on Wednesday, the cabinet defended President Muhammadu Buhari's approval of 1.5 billion naira to buy 10 Toyota Land Cruiser vehicles for the Niger Republic. Kende Amodu reports. With speculations rife that the Federal Capital Territory is under siege, it is not surprising that the minister is boosting the capacity of security agencies with the purchase of vehicles and gadgets. But he is quick to downplay the purchase, describing it as routine. The support by the FCT administration is providing the security agencies operating within the FCT that is reflected in this memo is part of our continuous support to them. Uh, we do that in terms of providing logistic support, uh, equipment, and, and some other support. Uh, and this is just a coincidence, but it's part of our normal support to them. Uh, there is tremendous effort by all to make sure that Abuja continues to be a safe haven for all of us. Equally described as routine is the purchase of vehicles worth 1.5 billion naira for the Niger Republic. Minister of Finance Zainab Ahmed says it is not the first time Nigeria has had to support its neighbors to enhance their capacity to secure their countries. Also on Wednesday, the Council of Ministers announced the concession in arrangement of the Badagri Deep Sea Port under a public-private partnership. The project cost approved by the Cabinet stood at $2.59 billion, while it was approved that the seaport will be developed in four phases with a concessional period of 45 years. This project, it may interest you to know, will also generate a total revenue of over $53.6 billion over the concession period. It will create about one quarter million jobs and also uh, attract foreign direct investments to the country and help in improving Nigeria's economy in general and the well-being of Nigerians. Meanwhile, the Federal Executive Council has approved a national monitoring and evaluation policy for the country. This will establish a framework to promote good governance and accountability. From State House Abuja, Kende Amudu, Trust TV News. The leadership of the Nigerian Senate has held a closed-door meeting with heads of security agencies over the worsening insecurity in Nigeria. The meeting, chaired by the President of the Senate, Ahmad Lawan, was attended by other principal officers of the Senate and chairmen of security-related committees. The report. In attendance were Chief of Defense Staff, the Inspector General of Police, the Commandant General of the Civil Defense Corps, Director General of the National Intelligence Agency, as well as Director General of the Department of State Service. In his opening remarks before the close of meeting, the Senate President, Hamid Lawa, declared that Nigeria is at a crossroad with its very existence under threat, owing to the growing insecurity in the country. The security situation of Nigeria would have been far better. And Nigeria would have made more progress not only in the area of security, but in the area of our economy, which is tied to the security situation again. I believe that um, our security agencies and armed forces have been doing their best, but apparently we have to do more. 
to achieve what we desire to achieve. The Senate president told security chiefs that the level of insecurity was frightening. Lawa, who attributed the low national revenue to crude oil theft, maintained that the expectation is to begin to see drastic improvement in the security situation. This current present position where we are is most frightening because it's like there's nowhere to hide or nowhere to go. It's like insecurity is everywhere and especially if it is coming to the point of dislocating the security situation where the head, the head of government or where the government headquartered. So we, we really have to review and see what more we have to do and how differently we have to, to do. On his part, the Chief of Defense Staff, Major General Lucky Rabo, who noted that the issues of national security must be seen from a collective perspective, said a lot has happened with more being done to improve the security situation of the country. That quite a lot has happened, quite a lot has been done, quite a lot is being done to ensure that we improve on the security setting across the country. No one is leaving any stone on turn and redressing all the imbalances within the security environment. The meeting, which was at the instance of the Senate leadership, is to come up with practical solutions for insecurity in the country. As the National Defense College Abuja celebrates its 30th anniversary, it has seized the opportunity of the ceremony to profile solutions to the security challenges bedeviling the country. Part of the anniversary was the graduation of 2000. 549 participants and senior officers from Nigeria and other African countries, including Uganda, Burkina Faso, Liberia, among other countries, in the last 30 years. Delivering the graduation lecture virtually on Wednesday, Rwandan President Paul Kagame stressed the need for support through regional and bilateral cohesion to address the security threats Nigeria faces highlighting the role of the armed forces as the pillar of any well-governed and developed state. The security establishment has to play a positive role within the structures of governance, otherwise sustainable development cannot occur. If roads are unsafe, they won't be traded. If citizens fear attack, there will be no investment. And if education is disrupted, the conflict cycle will continue for another generation. But it goes even deeper than that. Defense and security go hand in hand with the governments. The two systems have to reinforce each other without working in silos. That means it is just as important for defense forces to invest in training and citizen outreach activities as in equipment and infrastructure. Security is ultimately about the mindset that prevails in the country. A long term, future-oriented way of thinking is what makes development sustainable. It's about building trust between citizens and the public institutions that serve them. Citizens need to feel not only physically safe, but also fully included in the governments. Gunmen on Wednesday attacked the Assistant Inspector General of Police in charge of Zone 12, Audu Madaki, in the Bade area of Kaduna, killing his orderly, 
Madaki and a yet to be identified officer survived the attack but sustained gunshot wounds along Bade Jargindi village. They were on their way to the monthly conference of the Inspector General of Police, Usman Al-Kali Baba, and senior police officers from the rank of Commissioners of Police. Top on the agenda is the security situation in the country, which the IGP says is crucial to creating a pathway towards resolving these security issues in the country. Part of the issues to be discussed is extortion and brutality by policemen, adequate protection of police barracks and formations, countering ambush attacks, as well as lectures on civility and professionalism. Terrorists have attacked and killed three people in Datsauni village in Batagalawa local government area of Kasina state. One of the victims, Abu Rashid Abba Mana, was killed at Dansauni village, which is only one kilometer from Barbara Ruga village, the scene of last Sunday's attack. Reports say Abu Rashid Abba Mana went to farm but was trapped and killed by the terrorists. The terrorists also abducted dozens of people, including women and children, during the attack. This is the second time terrorists are attacking Babaruga village, which is just three kilometers from the Asian city of Katana. And because of their siege, they killed two residents and rustled and specified number of animals. Residents say the terrorists, numbering about 30 armed with AK-47 rifles, arrived at the village around 2 a.m. on Sunday night and forced their way into the houses of their victims. Most of our families have fled this village since Monday morning to areas perceived to be safer in Katana. And almost every one of us here passed the night either on the rooftop or on top of trees. This resident who narrowly escaped from the hands of his abductors has a gory tells about the terrorists in human behavior. My escape from the hands of terrorists is by the special grace of God. It is by Allah's intervention I escaped. We were about 11 abductees. They were pushing and beating mercilessly along footpath in the bushes. It was dark at night and I tactfully withdrew. The sad thing is that residents claim that they put several distress calls through to security operatives, which were not responded to. After this attack, which they were left to their devices, residents say they are now living in fear of another attack. About seven kilometers away from Baburuga on Katsina Basari Road, the terrorists attack at 2.45 a.m. On the same night, Corey and The Nigeria Railway Corporation NRC has suspended train services on the Lagos Abuja and Ajakuta routes over safety concerns. Managing Director of the NRC, Fidet Ohiria, who confirmed this on Wednesday, said the decision followed a report of an attempted kidnapping of passengers that left the Ajakuta station by road on their way to Abuja. According to him, the passengers and their vehicles were shot at in the process but escaped from the attackers. Ohiria explained that the passengers have been advised to use any of the adjacent stations in Itakwe North or Itogbo South until the security situation in the area improves. The NRC MD said the Wari Itakwe train service is still on as the train left Wari this morning on its way to Itakwe. The Federal Capital Territory Administration, FCTA, has pulled down trees and shanties at a forest in Pasali along Kuje Guagualada Road, suspected to be a haven for bandits and other criminal elements. According to reports, the Department of Development Control and Sanitation executed the demolition on Wednesday. 
The FCTA had earlier warned of plans to remove illegal structures along the Tipa Garage and Kuje Gwagwalada Road axis. The senior special assistant on monitoring, inspection and enforcement to the FCT minister, Ikaro Ata, told newsmen after the exercise that the aim was to clear the area of illegalities and restore it to the approved master plan. The People's Democratic Party Board of Trustees met in Abuja on Wednesday to discuss critical issues affecting the party. Top among the issues is the lingering acrimony between River State Governor Nyeson Wike and its presidential candidate Atiku Abubakar as a fallout of the party's presidential primary. Speaking shortly after the meeting on behalf of the BOT, Senator Abdul Ningi declined to make public the grievances of the governor, saying the committee is set up to hold a meeting with Atiku Abubakar and reach out to Wike to find solution to the existing acrimony between the two parties. We have equally set out in this meeting committee of the BOT to be able to interface between warring factions, particularly between the acrimony that is taking place between the candidate and any other uh, conflict that is taking place in the nation within our party uh, formation. Governor A. Umaru Fintiri of Adamawa State has picked a female professor, Kale Tapwa Farauta, as his running mate for the 2023 election. Speaking at the unveiling ceremony in Yola on Wednesday, Fintiri said Professor Farauta was selected based on her honesty, integrity, transparency, and hard work. He said she's expected to discharge her responsibilities with due diligence and fear of God, in addition to her motherly role of keeping the home. Governor Fintiri urged the opposition parties to join his administration to work for the progress and development of the state. In her remarks, Farauta, who described her selection as an act of God, expressed appreciation to Governor Fintiri and the PDP for finding her worthy for the position and assured of her commitment to serve with loyalty, dedication, and fear of God. The PDP in Gombe State has asked the Abuja Division of the Federal High Court to disqualify Governor Inua Yahaya and Deputy Governor Jetau Daniel from contesting in the 2023 governorship election. The party accused the duo of submitting forged certificates. The PDP in its governorship candidate, Mohamed Bade, sought disqualification in a suit between the PDP and to others against the INEC and others. The PDP argued that Messrs. Yahaya and Jetau, having deposed to forms EC9, the said forms constituted certificates and making a false statement in them amounted to submitting forged certificates. No date has been fixed for a hearing in the suit. The crisis rocking the All Progressives Congress in Benue State has taken a dangerous dimension as arsonists in the early hours of Wednesday set ablaze the residence of a chieftain of the party, Abubakar Usman, in Oturupo, Benue State. Reports say the residence located at GRA Oturupo was set on fire around 3 a.m. by unknown arsonists. The fire raised the front section of the building, which housed the security post and auxiliary buildings. Abu Bakr, a one-time senatorial candidate of Benue South, had a few days ago displayed a mock coffin with a condolence register of APC at the front of his house to express his displeasure with the leadership of APC in the state over the choice of deputy governorship candidate he and others opposed. Former Minister of Science, Technology and Innovation, 
and former governor of old Abia State, Ogbonaya Ono says, contrary to reports making the rounds, he has not at any time endorsed the Labour Party and its presidential candidate, Peter Obi, for the presidency come 2023. The former governor who sought and lost the bid to become presidential flag bearer for the All Progressives Congress, APC, said his loyalty remains with the ruling party and as such, all reports of his involvement in any form of anti-party activity should be disregarded. He further stressed in a statement that claims suggesting he endorsed another party are mischievous, wicked and unfortunate. He therefore advised the public to ensure all claims are verified to avoid spreading fake news. The Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offences Commission, ICPC, is said to partner relevant stakeholders to curb vote buying during elections in the country. The Commission's Chief Superintendent, Public Enlightenment, Femi Gold, stated this in an interview with newsmen in Abuja. He said, beyond the arrest and prosecution of vote buyers, the ICPC was intensifying sensitization campaigns in collaboration with stakeholders against the Menes. The official said, while the commission would continue to arrest vote traders, sensitization was key in curbing the illegal act. Gold said, as part of the efforts, the ICPC had signed a memorandum of understanding with the Independent National Electoral Commission to strengthen the campaign against vote buying. You're watching NewsHour on Trust TV. Coming up after the break, Boronu flyover builder goes to school. Stay with us. The rains are here again. Floods are ravaging. Why? As residents of FCT, we have made some wrong choices. Dumping refuse in water channels, building on waterways, damaging water lines. The consequences of flooding can be devastating. Lives are lost. Properties are damaged. People are displaced. Farmlands are destroyed. Don't make the wrong choices. Don't build on floodplains. Don't dump refuse in waterways. Don't damage water lines. Clear all refuse in waterways around your premises. Together, we can safeguard lives and property. Do the right thing now. For emergencies, please call 112 or 122. This message is from the FCT Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, this is NewsHour on Trust TV. A recap of our top stories. National Broadcasting Commission has imposed a 5 million naira fine on Trust Television for broadcasting documentary on banditry. And Nigerian Air Force has launched Operation Show No Mercy against terrorists. Moving to other stories, the Gombe state government says it has confirmed the outbreak of monkeypox in the state. The state commissioner for health, Habu Dahiru, disclosed this at a press briefing on Tuesday. Dahiru said the state has recorded three positive cases of monkeypox after 19 suspected cases were examined. The health commissioner said the ministry has put necessary mechanisms in place, including a surveillance team to manage the outbreak of the disease across the state. That organization declared monkeypox as a public health emergency of international concern. Now between January 1st and the 1st July 2022, Nigeria has recorded over 135 confirmed cases from 26 states of the federation. And in Gombe State here, we have 19 suspected cases, 
three were confirmed laboratory by PCR. There were no death. All the three were admitted and discharged, treated and discharged. In these cases presented with fever, lasting for more than one week despite treatment for common causes of fever. They developed rashes on the face and other parts of the body, which prompted suspicion of monkeypox. You will also recall that monkeypox is a rare viral zoonotic disease with an incubation period of 5 to 21 days. The reservoir remains unknown, but African rodents are suspected to play a significant part in the transmission. The Yobe State Commissioner for Youth and Sports, Goni Buka Lawan, has been killed in a fatal crash. Lawan, who was a former member of the House of Representatives, died in the lone crash involving Take a break now, please. TV, documenting the Nigerian story. UNICEF has urged Sokoto and Zamfara state governments to ensure the full implementation of the sustainability plan of girls' education in schools. Sokoto State Chief of field office, Miriam Dawesh made the appeal during a media dialogue on girls' education project, GEP3, in Sokoto, the report. Girls Education Project, GEP3, is funded by the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office of the UK and implemented by the UNICEF in collaboration with the governments of the six GEP3 states, which include Bauchi, Kanu, Katsina, Niger, Sokoto, and Zamfara states. The GEP3 is meant to increase enrollment of girls in schools in the six states with a view to ensuring inclusiveness in basic education for all children from primary to secondary school level. It is against this backdrop that the media dialogue on girls' education is put together by UNICEF in collaboration with the Sokoto State Government for relevant stakeholders, especially media practitioners, to arm them with the knowledge of the girls' education project, GEP3, so that they can enlighten people on the project plan. 
and to also enlighten parents on the importance of girl children education and encourage enrollment of girls in schools. The UNICEF Sokoto Chief of Field Office, Mariam Dawesh, pointed out that the Girls Education Project had enrolled 418,614 girls in schools in Sokoto State, while 545,711 in Zamfara State, but said there is room for improvement. While there is remarkable increase in enrollment in the two states, the Chief of Field Office stressed the need for the states to demonstrate leadership by allocating resources willpower to ensure the sustainability of the project. The idea between, uh, behind this media dialogue is to actually bring to the fore the importance of uh, girl, girl education in Nigeria as a whole. And of course we are in Sokoto here. Um, it's the girl education program uh, called GAP3, which brings us here today. But I think I would like to focus on the larger picture um, not necessarily, you know, just um, GAP3. GAP3 is just one of the organs to make sure that uh, we advocate and deliver uh, girl education um, in the country as a whole. And of course, for us, we are responsible for right now Sokoto and Zamfara. Education is an important building block and the most impactful way to empower girls. It influences critical human development outcomes. It reduces inequality. Educated girls are far more likely to be aware of issues surrounding violence and abuse and are less likely to become victims of domestic and sexual abuse or human trafficking. Educated girls are health citizens who raise healthier families. Educating women results in promoting self-respect and also helps in raising the status of women. Lower infant and child mortality as well as maternal mortality rates are a result of girls' education, and education ensures economic growth. Participants of the five days media dialogue on girl education were drawn from Abuja, Sokwato, and Zamfara states, which are expected to promote the importance of girls' education. Journalists and public relations practitioners have agreed to cross-fertilize ideas to check the menace of quackery in the media space. They are, however, appealing to government to accord the media its appropriate status. Dashin Hussein Ausman has more. There is a growing consensus that systems should be put in place to check quackery in the media industry. The onus is on journalists to bring up the right set of professionals to retool the system. At the head of public relations professionals is Dr. Mukhtar Saraju, who is stressing the need for strategic advocacy. Saraju brings to the fore the challenges journalists face in Nigeria, suing for developmental journalism and conflict-sensitive reporting. We are here to see how we can partner with the NUG to ensure that both the journalism and PR professions are read of quacks. We are prepared to listen to the NUG and uh, of course, I believe it will also listen to us to see how we can cross-fertilize ideas to fight this menace. Otherwise, we'll continue to be embarrassed unnecessarily by people who have no business being anywhere near our two professions. The national president, Nigeria Union of Journalists, Chris Isiguzo, tasks journalists to shun religion not pander to political actors and to discuss Nigeria in earnest. He buttressed the need to change the perception the public has about journalists as communicators by setting a new agenda and applying their roles to the expectation of society. When Nigeria is divided along religious lines, tribal lines, ethnic lines, political lines, I don't think there has been any time in the nation's history that we've been this divided. But we are not going to give up. I'm an incurable optimist when it comes to keeping hope alive. I believe that all of us together must work together, must join hands and build this big country of our dreams. Journalists have tried to weed out quackery, but the consensus is that there is the need to do more 
as perception managers. Dashan Husseina Usman, Trust TV News, Abuja. Mohammed Sani, a 13 years old boy, caught the attention of the world when he constructed the replica of the new Maiduguri Bridge using sticks and mud. He is now placed on full scholarship in one private school by the Borno State Government. Kurutsi Bitrus has been monitoring the development. He meets the boy to find out the inspiration behind his creativity. The report. This is the Meduguri City flyover, first of its kind in Borno State. Its beauty inspired 13-year-old Musa Sani to build a replica of the bridge with mud, cement, paint, and sticks. His parents said Musa has been making wonderful art right from age five. He loves art, passion for sculpting, and have a dream of becoming a civil engineer someday. When I see something beautiful, I mold it. Like when my mom took me out, we passed the customs flyover. I loved the view. So I went on my own one day, took a critical look of it, then came home and looked for materials to mold it. I wish I could have a big space where I can design lots of things have a house of our own and don't walk to school every day. His mother said his talent amazed her and the family. She said he'd never learned designing from school nor textbooks, but does it with passion and accuracy, adding that it is her hope to support him to do more amazing things in the future. <laughs> He has been designing since at the age of five. When I noticed the beautiful work, I started buying materials for him. But when he does it, children destroys it. So he keeps it close to his bed. I wish we have the means to get a big house where there's open field so he can continue molding things. I know he's going to become someone in future, and I pray for God's intervention so I can take care of him and my other children. Like every child, Musa hope one day he will be able to build a house for his parents and a huge company that can support other children's creativity. But for now, he is focusing on the education that will pave way for him to achieve his dreams. The Nigeria Deposit Insurance Corporation, NDIC, has warned that it does not cover investments with fund managers, notwithstanding assurances by many of the operators. In a statement signed by the Director, Communication and Public Affairs Department, Bashir Nuhu, the corporation said the clarification became necessary to sensitize the public on the high risks involved in investing with illegal fund managers. Investment with fund managers has become a lush business in recent years, with many promising mouth-watering monthly returns on such funds. While a few fulfill their promises, the majority flee with investors' funds, leaving behind a trail of agony and regrets. NDIC said it had a responsibility to protect depositors of licensed banks and not those who give it to the deceits of illegal fund managers. We will now join Chamun Dabeng for more business news. The Corporate Affairs Commission, CAC, has announced the National Identification Number, NIN, would take the place of applicant signatures for business and company registration. This was revealed by the Registrar General of CAC, Garba Abubakar. He disclosed the affiliation between CAC and the National Identity Management Commission, NIMSI. According to him, the CAC alongside NIMSI have advanced in their reform initiatives for efficient service delivery. According to Abubakar, the CAC might merely 
require NIN enrollment numbers which are available in other jurisdictions instead of signatures to process registration. In the past seven years, Nigerian firms have reduced their investments by 56%, according to statistics from the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. Investments by manufacturers decreased from 484.44 billion naira to 217.22 billion naira between 2016 and 2021. Investment decisions were frequently influenced by policy certainty. This is according to Deputy President of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry, LCCI, Gabriel Ida. He claimed that the volatility of Nigeria's foreign exchange market and Naira's depreciation was the main concern for investors. In the past three months, the central bank increased the benchmark interest rate from 11.5 to 14 percent. The increasing cost of borrowing, according to the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria, MAN, will lead to increased costs of manufacturing inputs, which will automatically translate to higher pricing of goods, low sales, and massive volume of inventory of unsold products. The Small and Medium Enterprises Development Agency of Nigeria, SMEDAN, has committed to leveraging partnership within the D8 to promote encourage, advance, and support MSME's activities both nationally and within the DH region in order to further strengthen economic, trade, and commercial integration and links. According to Director General of Smidan Olawale Fasonya, the agency is confident that the establishment of the DH Center for Small and Medium Enterprises, SMEs, will have a significant influence on growth because a proposal for a DH Center has already been submitted. Given the importance of MSMEs in the economy, but also also their precarious position, Fasonya has also committed to working with important stakeholders to bring about a positive change in the narrative surrounding their development in Nigeria. That's all for Business News. I am Chamun Dabeng. And now to the foreign scene. Talks to revive the 2015 nuclear deal between Iran and world powers are set to resume as representatives from Iran and the United States return to Vienna for a new round of discussions mediated by the European Union. The bloc's coordinator for the talks, Enrique Mora, in addition to top negotiators from Tehran and Washington, were reportedly heading back to the Austrian capital on Wednesday for indirect talks that I expected to begin on Thursday. The original format, also including China, Russia, France, Germany, and the United Kingdom, shaping a joint commission that began talks to restore the nuclear accord in April 2021, will be reconvened. Russia's chief negotiator, Mikhail Ulyanov, wrote on Twitter that talks would resume shortly and that Russian negotiators stand ready for constructive talks in order to finalize the agreement. More than 5,000 soldiers from Indonesia, the United States, and other countries have begun joint combat exercises on the Indonesian island of Sumatra, signaling stronger ties amid growing maritime activity by China in the Indo-Pacific region. The annual military training, known as Garuda Shield, has been taking place since 2009, but this year sees the participation of several other countries, including Australia and Japan, making it the largest ever. The joint exercises, which began on Wednesday, are designed to strengthen interoperability, capability, trust, and cooperation in support of a free and open Indo-Pacific, the U.S. Embassy in Jakarta said in a statement. Charles Flynn, commanding general of, commanding general of U.S. Army Pacific and Indonesia's military chief, General Andika Pakasa, opened the joint drills with a ceremony on Wednesday morning on Batu Raja, a coastal town in South Sumatra province. And finally, in sports, Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, and Paraguay have submitted a joint bid to host the 2030 World Cup. Uruguay, 
who hosted the competition's first ever tournament in 1930, say they want to bring the World Cup home when it celebrates its centenary. Spain and Portugal have also announced a bid to be joint hosts. Uruguay beat Argentina in the final to win the inaugural World Cup in 1930 stadium. In 1930 at Montevideo's Centenario Stadium where Dominguez was speaking from. The 2022 World Cup will be held in Qatar while Canada, Mexico and the USA will be joint hosts in 2026. FIFA plans to select the 2030 hosts in 2024. Let's now join Adini Adishafe for more sports news. The Nigeria University Games Association, NUGA, and the Nigerian Boxing Federation, NBF, have jointly announced that boxing will be the 18th medal sport at the 2024 NUGA Games in Jos Plateau State. Technical chairman of NUGA, Musa Yakasai, says boxing will be joining other combatant sports like taekwondo, judo, and karate, which are medal sports at NUGA. Yakasai also noted that the decision also took into consideration the fact that many students indicated interest in boxing, as well as a demonstration carried out at the last NUGA Games at the University of Lagos to that effect. He also urged the Minister of Youth and Sports, Sunday Dare, to back a policy that would make it mandatory for Nigerian university students to be considered for selection for the Olympic Games, Commonwealth Games, and all African Games in the future, given the depth of talent at the universities. President of Nigerian University Games Association, Nuga, Eme Kaobu, described the partnership with MBF as a worthy initiative as to enable students to channel their energy into boxing, tackle and social behavior, and equip the female student with self-defense skills. 52 students registered for boxing at the last games and will attend the World University Games bill for Turkey in September. As Nigeria continues its quest for to win more medals at the 2022 Commonwealth Games, the last batch of Team Nigeria athletes has arrived Birmingham with a view to participate in the more sporting events. The last batch of wrestling athletes were led by the Director of Federations, Athletes and Elite, FEED, Department of the Federal Ministry of Youth and Sport Development, Simon Ebojae. Team Nigeria will be competing with 10 wrestlers comprising 6 women and 4 men. The list is headlined by Olympic Games silver medalist Blessing Oborodudu, Commonwealth Game Champion Odwanyo Adekuroye, Messi Adekuroye, Messi Genesis, Kolaoli Esther, Hannah Ruben, Ebikeremo Welsin, Agiomon Ekerekeme, and Amas Daniel. The Commonwealth Games will end on the 8th of August 2022. That's Sport News. I am Adeni Ajishafe. And with that, we have come to the end of News Hour on Trust TV. For more news, connect with us across all our social media platforms. I am Ayindeshu Aga, thanking you for watching.